Well, you just heard that we are in a few weeks speaking about the Trinity, and we are exploring the words of St. Augustine, who said that we see the Trinity whenever we see love. Augustine says that the Trinity gives us three distinct expressions of God's love. And so last week, we read the words, God is love. That is the scripture that ultimately led Augustine to this conclusion. And so we talked about what it means that God is a lover. Today, we are going to turn to Jesus as God's beloved. And you just heard the scripture we'll use to talk about that, the most quoted words of scripture, I think, John 3.16. And I wish I could know what is going through your heads when you hear the shorthand for this scripture, John 3.16. But before we turn and read those words once again, let's pray. Oh God, we give you thanks that your spirit is still flowing afresh to us. Pour out your spirit on these ancient words so that they may be a living word once more. Pour out your spirit on these words so that we may come to know something new of you and your love. And having heard this word, May we leave here as people ready to live your life-giving and loving word out in the world. In your son's name we pray. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Usually John 3.16 gets separated from the verse that follows, but it is an important verse. So verse 17, indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now this scripture is a staple of highway billboards, bumper stickers, football games, and all sorts of sporting events. Maybe you knew the words before I read them because we know these, this scripture as its shorthand, John 3.16. Usually it doesn't take more than that for our minds to begin reciting the words, for God so loved. But aside from being plastered at, on posters at sporting events, I think these words often get used as an unfortunate filter or litmus test. I can still remember a college classmate approaching me one day to ask for a conversation. I just assumed that he had a question since we were in a class together, but he was focused on something else entirely. We sat down in the student union and he didn't waste a single minute with small talk. Have you been saved? He asked point blank. And there was a sense of sincere urgency to his question. I don't remember exactly how I responded, but it was some version of, I don't think we're the same flavor of Christians. Now, despite the wide gap in our beliefs, I think we both did the same thing in that moment. We both categorized each other as outsiders. To him, I was on the outside of eternal life, leaving him with a choice to make. He could walk away or he could double down and persuade me that my eternal future was at stake. But I categorized him as an outsider too, on the outside of Christianity as I know it, and noting his religious fanaticism, I categorized him in that moment, and I also began to pay attention to who I saw him hanging out with because I wanted to know to avoid them too, should any of them approach me for a conversation. I didn't want to relive that moment with someone else. John 3.16, the subtext of this scripture has become, are you saved like us or are you crazy like them? It's a pretty quick litmus test. And surely we could sit here and exchange the stories that you have of experience with this scripture, how it's been mangled and disfigured into a test of sorts. 
The great reformer Martin Luther had another take on this scripture. He calls John 3.16 the gospel in miniature. If you need a pocket-sized gospel, carry around a slip of paper with this verse on it. They say all that needs to be said, according to Luther. Now, the word gospel literally means good news. And when scripture is reduced to a litmus test and becomes good news for only some, that's not the gospel. But I do think Martin Luther was on to something, that this is truly good news, and news that we all need to hear. So listen again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. For God so loved, loved the world that God gave, not to condemn, but to save. Now, when we make this scripture a litmus test or a way to sort ourselves into groups and what kinds of Christians, we're enticing ourselves into believing that this good news is about us and about what we do and about what we believe. But what makes this good news is that it's not about what we do. It's about what God does. God loves. God loves the world. God gives. God saves. In Jesus, God took that grand love for creation and made it particular, showing us love in human form. I heard the story of a child who was frightened by a midnight storm, probably much the same as what we experienced last night, and she was so scared she called out for her mother, Her mother came in and hugged her and reassured her in the night until she calmed down. And then as the mother was just about to leave her room, she said, don't worry, God is always with you. I know, said the little girl, but tonight I needed someone with skin. God chose to put skin on by sending his beloved And as Jesus welcomed the rejected and embraced children and broke bread with sinners and tax collectors, as he healed lepers and sought out the lost and the weak, as he loved all the way to the cross, he always pointed people back to God. He loved without reservation or qualification, not because he was trying to prove something or win an award or a leadership appointment, not even because he wanted to see people a different way, even though he did want to teach us a different way, but he loved first and foremost because he had been loved first, fully and completely. And basking in that love, he couldn't help but to point people to the very source of his love. And guess what? He hasn't stopped. Jesus continues to welcome the rejected, those who didn't get into their first choice colleges, those who didn't get the offer letter from the firm they wanted, those who love someone who doesn't love them back. Jesus continues to embrace all children, which each of us should be able to attest to. That's why we're here. He continues to break bread with sinners and tax collectors and lawyers. Just look around. He heals lepers, and he embraces those who aren't perfect. And he still seeks the lost and the weak because we keep showing up to hear his good news. And we wouldn't be here this morning if he didn't love us all the way to the cross so that we could continue to worship and glorify God. Jesus is still pointing people to God, the very source of his love the very source of our love. In Jesus, God calls each of us beloved. We too get to be fueled by that divine love. Now, if we think of the Trinity as God's promises to us, 
The first promise being that God's love will pursue us. Then the promise that we can glean from Jesus the beloved is this. It's not about what we do. It's about what God does. While we separate and sort out, find ways to filter people as unworthy or beyond the bounds of God's love as we understand it, that's not what God does. In Jesus, God offers an invitation beyond any limits of our making or imagining. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Not God so loved the Christians that he gave his only son. Not God so loved a certain political party that he gave his only son. Not God so loved a certain race that he gave his only son. Not God so loved a certain country that he gave his only son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And that means that God loves each of us who live in this world. You see, God's not so interested in our arbitrary litmus tests. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter how much you know or don't know. It doesn't matter what your financial position is. It doesn't matter how many scriptures you can spout out off the top of your head. It doesn't matter how broken you are. It doesn't matter what your marital status is. It doesn't matter how messed up your life is right now. It doesn't matter that you just got promoted. It doesn't matter what your skin color is. It doesn't matter if you have a family to call your own. It doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter what you've said about God or about church in the past doesn't matter if you failed. It doesn't matter what sins you've committed. It doesn't matter if you're born again or even know what it means to be born again. It doesn't matter if you're skeptical of eternal life. It doesn't matter because it's not about you. For God so loved the world. It is always and only about God and what God does. That's what Jesus showed us with his life, that God's love transcends all the boundaries we've created for ourselves. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Now, there is much that I don't understand and can't explain about those words. But here's what I do understand. For God so loved the world. And I think that is something worth hanging on to. For God so loves the world that God put skin on so we could see love lived out. And I think that is a call and an invitation for each of us to put skin on God's love, to make our lives irresistible sermons proclaiming this good news of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And because of that, we know what fearless love really looks like. Do you hear the liberation nestled in that truth? For God so loved the world? No litmus test. We don't have to pretend to be anything other than human. We don't have to pretend to be perfect, to have every answer, to be spotless and blameless, to be somehow deserving of divine grace. It's not about us. It's about God. And God loves, God gives, God saves. What if we put skin on that love? Maybe then this could be good news not only for some, but for the world. In the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself.